So there were two brothers, two men that uh, lived in a community. Uh, they had never been married, probably because no woman would love them other than their mother. Uh, these men were just dirty, rotten scoundrels, no good for nothing, bad to the bone, horrible people, but they were wealthy. And one of them uh, passed away, and the living brother uh, went to the preacher who was to conduct the funeral and asked him to call his brother a saint. That's the only request he had was, would you please, during the service in front of the community, call my brother a saint. But the pastor said, there's no way I can do that. Everyone in town knows your brother. They know what kind of man he was, and I can't lie from the pulpit. So the brother said, I, I know you're working on this building campaign, raising funds, and you need some money for your children's program, and I'm sure you, could, you would appreciate a nice uh, check for conducting this funeral. So, so I'm prepared to give you $10 million if you will call my brother a saint. So what did the preacher do? He took the money. He put $8 million in the building fund. He put $1.9 million in the children's fund, and he put $100,000 in his own bank account. And when it came time for the funeral and he stood before the congregation, he, he pointed toward the body that was before them and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to know that the man laying in front of you was a good-for-nothing scoundrel. He cheated. He swindled. He was a womanizer and he was just about the worst person you will ever meet. And he looked across the congregation met eyes with the brother, remembered his promise, and said, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You can always find someone to point at to make you feel better about yourself. You can always find someone that can make you look good. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about this passage from Luke, and I want you to remember, don't be that guy, okay? So as we look at the passage, uh, who was Jesus telling this story to? A parable is simply a story with a message. So who is he telling this story to? Uh, verse 9 tells us that he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And we're going to define a couple of words further here. Uh, so if you have your notes page, I've written them down because I'm going to horribly uh, destroy the Greek language as I try to pronounce a couple of them. There are people in here now that know Greek much better than I do, so just ignore my pronunciations. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is... Uh, in this passage, it says those who trusted in themselves, and that comes from the Greek word of papiothetus. Like I said, it's a dead language. I can pronounce it however I want, right? Uh, it's a word that means persuaded or convinced. Jesus is talking to some men, some Pharisees, who had persuaded, not, not others, not God, but they had persuaded themselves, they had convinced themselves that they were righteous. Now, having a degree in psychology, I am a firm believer in the power of positive thinking. Self-affirmation, saying good things about yourself, is a wonderful thing. Stinking thinking will tear you down and destroy you from the inside out. But affirming yourself is a good thing. But there comes a point when positive thinking becomes more like lying to yourself. And I think these Pharisees had had, had this power of positive thinking to the point that they were lying to themselves. That they had credited themselves to be righteous. That, that's the other word I want us to look at is righteous. It comes from the Greek uh, dikaios, and, and it means characterized by or acceptable forms of morality and justice. It means upright, fair, just, equitable. It, it means that they were in right standing before God. When we say that we are righteous, that's what we're saying. We're in right standing before God. So Jesus is telling this parable, this story with a purpose, 
to some who had convinced themselves, they had persuaded themselves that they were moral and just and fair. They had, they had convinced themselves uh, and, and trusted in themselves and persuaded themselves that they were right before God. And because of all that, they despised. They had a disdain for. They, they regarded with contempt those who were not like them. So what was the story? Two men went to the temple to pray. Let me tell you something about these two men. These two men, you won't read this in the scripture, but as these two men walked into the temple, in God's eyes, they were equal. God didn't see a rich cheater and a wise preacher. Uh, God didn't see a self-righteous, pompous Pharisee and a low-down, dirty traitor. God saw two men that needed to have a relationship with their Creator. God saw His children coming into His temple. But that's not how they saw themselves, and that's not how they saw one another. So we'll start with the Pharisee. He was well-educated, trained in the leading schools in Jerusalem. He studied the Torah. That's the first five books of what we call our Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. Not, not only did he know it by heart, he could start quoting at Genesis 1-1 and quote you all of Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He could quote the entire Torah if, he wa if you wanted him to. So he studied the Torah, he knew the Torah, but not only that, he knew the Mishnah. The Mishnah was like a commentary on the Torah. So for a verse, there may be paragraphs or chapters to explain that one verse in the Mishnah. And he knew that by heart. He studied it. He knew it. Not only did he know the Torah and the Mishnah that was a commentary on the Torah, he studied the Talmud. And the Talmud was basically a library of commentaries on the Mishnah. So where the Mishnah may take a verse and write a paragraph or a chapter about it, the Talmud would take a book to write about a paragraph or a chapter of the Mishnah, which was about one verse. This Pharisee knew the law. He studied God's word more than anyone you can imagine. And when he walked out in public, people ooed and awed over him. They wanted to be like him. They, they looked up to him. He's the kind of person they would suggest run for office and community and lead others. When he walked into the te temple, people would come to him to learn from him how it was that they were to follow the law, how it was they were to be righteous, and what needed to happen for God to bless Israel again. Then there was the tax collector. Uh, King James calls him the publican. He was a crook. He, was, uh, he, he made his wealth by working for the enemy. As a Jew, his job was to collect taxes from his fellow Jews and give it to the Romans. But he made his salary by overcharging and, and keeping the difference. So if you, you owed $100 in taxes, he would charge you 150 and keep the 50 and give the 100 to the Romans. When he walked into a room, people stopped talking and started whispering. People avoided him in the marketplace. He was so despised, he could not even hold public office. I mean, I know today if you watch Fox News or CNN, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you, you must be a crook as a prerequisite to hold public office, it seems. But back then, they looked up to their politicians, and he was so despised, he couldn't even hold public office. No one liked him. So the Pharisee comes into the temple to pray. 
And he addresses God, but he spent the entire time talking about himself. He stood in a place of prominence where he was expected to stand. But his prayer was more about him than it was about God. In in the span of the two verses we read, he says, I or my five times. He was completely focused on himself. I heard one preacher say, he couldn't see his sin because his eyes were too close together. His prayer seemed more like a resume of who he was and who he was not. He justified himself based on what he saw in others. He compared himself to cheats and crooks and traitors like the tax collector. Like I said before, we can always make ourselves look good if we point a finger at someone else. If we can point out their sins, maybe no one will see our mistakes. But it isn't other sinners we need to compare ourselves to. It's Jesus. then there's the tax collector. Where did he stand? Depending on the translation, it's some version of he stood afar off. He stood in the shadows. We're talking 2,000 years ago. He would have been standing in a temple that was lit by oil lamps where incense was being burned. It would be smoky. It would be shadowed. He would have been off into the shadows in the smoke where no one could see him. He wouldn't come to the altar. He wouldn't come into the light. He couldn't even force himself to look up to heaven. He was so ashamed. And he prayed a prayer that you and I need to remember and pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. There was no comparison except to God. There was no resume except that he was a sinner. There was no pride, only humility. No matter who we compare ourselves to other than Jesus, no matter how many times we share our resume with others, we will never make ourselves righteous. What you do is not what makes you right before God. Only Jesus Christ, what he has done and continues to do in and through us, is what can make us righteous and make us right before God. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That prayer is something we need to remember and we need to practice. When I was in seminary, Uh, One of the classes that I didn't get credit for, but I would have been kicked out if I didn't attend, it's one of those classes, um, was one on discipleship. And during one of the semesters, we were challenged to pray this prayer, or a version of it that we find in other places within the New Testament. We, We were challenged to pray it at various times in ministry. And it would... It kept me centered throughout that semester, and it's something that I continue to do today. As I would be preparing for a funeral, or walking down the hallway of a hospital, I would pray, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a pastor. As I prepared for my father's death and then my mother's death this year, it was, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a son. As, as I would prepare for uh, you know, disciplining someone or, or, or being disciplined and called into the boss's office, as I would prepare for ministry, as I would prepare for any aspect of my life, I would just repeat over and over as I walked to where I was headed, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Have mercy on me, a student. Have mercy on me, a father. Have mercy on me, a pastor. Have mercy on me, a sinner. It's a prayer we need to pray and should pray. Because as much as we want to think we are the tax collector in this story, as much as we want to be humble and, and focus our, our sin, on, our, our, on our sins and our failures, if we really look at our lives and how we live, most of us, if we are honest, have to admit that there is a little bit of the Pharisee in us. We can say, don't be that guy, but if we're honest, we have to admit we kind of already are. And here's what I want you to take away from this message today. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. It doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest person in town or the poorest person in town. It doesn't matter if you've lied and, and cheated and climbed your way to the top or if you have stepped on every lowly person on your way to the top. It doesn't matter if you're one of the people that was the lowly people that got stepped on while someone else climbed the ladder of success. When you come to this table, when you come to the Lord, you are the same as everyone else. You, my friend, are a sinner in need of a Savior. When God looks at you, He doesn't see your bank account, how big it is or how small it is, or even if it's overdrawn. When God looks at you, He doesn't see your status or your prestige. He doesn't see your skin color or your race. He doesn't see if you're male or female. He doesn't see if you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel or you should be right up there with Mother Teresa. God doesn't see any of that. When God looks at you, He sees His beautiful creation that needs to have a relationship with the Creator. When God looks at you, He sees His child. So today, as you come to this table, I pray that you will see yourself not as you see yourself, but you will see yourself through the eyes of your Savior. A sinner in need of a Savior. And if you've never made the decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, I pray that today will be the day that you do that. And at the end of the service, I'll be at the back. Hang around. I'd love to talk to you, to pray with you, to guide you along the way as you seek to recognize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Let's pray.